Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today as we embark on an incredibly important discussion as part one of the Beyond Brave Spaces webinar series. My name is Nicola Willier Fenton. I will be helping to lead us into this discussion today with our presenters. Just a few logistics for us today. Thank you so much for joining us on YouTube. If there are questions that you have as we anticipate, we look forward to seeing those questions and we'll be watching those questions on YouTube and bringing them over to ask our presenters and panelists today. We have a team helping us. Kelly and Sherwood will be keeping an eye on those uh, questions and bringing them over. It is very likely we might not get to all of the questions, so we will put an email address up in the chance that we weren't able to get to your question and there can be some follow-up as well. We are recording today. We will share the recording out with everyone who has RSVP'd. If you're questioning whether you did RSVP and you're just joining us on YouTube, please do send us an email to make sure that you do receive the recording as well. Today's part one of our two-part series of Beyond Brave Spaces is brought to us by the Office of the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Today's discussion is called Not Just COVID, Examining the Centuries of Healthcare Inequities and Racial Trauma. And we'll meet our presenters in just a few moments. As I mentioned, chat box is where we'll be looking for those questions today. The session is being recorded and we are offering live and open caption today as well. Thank you to our team, Norma, who is doing the captioning for us. We'll have about a 45 minute presentation and time at the end for questions as well as we've mentioned. And we'll make sure to leave that session open at the end to have those questions to our panelists. A few group agreements for us today. We really want you to stay engaged and speak your truth, experience discomfort, and also accept and expect non-closure. I also would like to mention that and acknowledge the fact that the University of Vermont is located on land which has long served as a site of a meeting and exchange among indigenous people, peoples for thousands of years and is a home to the Western Abnaki people. UVM honors, recognizes, and respects these peoples, especially the Abnaki, as the traditional stewards of the land and waters which we are meeting and virtually meeting on today. In a moment, I'm going to go through our presenters and welcome them to the presentation today. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Jan Carney with us today as well. Dr. Carney is the Associate Dean for Public Health and Health Policy, Professor of Medicine, Director, Graduate Public Health Programs in the Robert Larner College of Medicine at UVM, and she's also the former Commissioner of Health of the State of Vermont. We're so fortunate to have Dr. Carney with us. Welcome. Dr. Marissa Coleman also is joining us. Welcome. Clinical Psychologist, the University of Vermont Medical Center, Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Robert Larner College of Medicine at UVM, serves on the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Steering Committees at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Coleman. And also, Dr. Brennan Ab Ab Abonu, excuse me, Assistant Professor, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from Yale University, research using experimental evolution, mathematical modeling, and computational biology to better understand the underlying causes and consequences of disease across scale a science writer, and a social justice advocate. Welcome. We're so happy to have you joining us today. And also, um, in the studio space with me today, we're so pleased to have our Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Dr. Wanda Heading grant who will be leading our discussion today. She's, as I mentioned, the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the University of Vermont, part of the Provost Education Executive Team, supports the work of the President's Commission for Inclus Inclusive Excellence, and has been the leader of this excellence series that has been started just about two months ago. So Dr. Heading Grant, I'm going to toss over to you to kick us off with the presentation today. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. Uh, we're going to have a good time today. Um, can you make sure you advance my slide, please? So welcome, everyone. As a nation, we watched last week a civil rights icon be honored and remembered. I take this moment to acknowledge Congressman John Lewis. I move forward in this space and time with many of his words in my heart and in my mind. Get in good trouble. 
necessary trouble. His words has always resonated with me, but now they are amplified for everyone to hear. Despite the challenges we face and the fear we may feel, we must redouble our efforts and insist on systemic reform. I know we cannot take on everything, but we can do something. We can have an impact right here at UVM and beyond. The murder of George Floyd and others due to racial injustices and disparate treatment of marginalized and vulnerable populations require us, at least I believe, to use our educational platform to share and enhance knowledge, understanding, ideas, and solutions that not only addresses issues of prejudice and discrimination, but also transform lives for generations to come. We must endeavor to inspire professionals who will be more just, equitable, compassionate, and anti-racist. Next slide, please. Using our platform to disseminate knowledge, UVM's recent Amazing Grace program and the three-part Systemic Racism Teach-In series, Finding Answers Together, was one way that the university chose to put its words into action. And now we continue today with the series Beyond Brave Spaces, conversations to inform and move to action together. It is a continuous process of developing sincere, authentic, and informed ways for us to show our active commitment to change in the dissemination of knowledge that helps us and others move toward the uprooting of systemic oppression, disparities, and injustices. We want to create brave spaces, environments where those in our community can authentically tell their truths and engage to come together to share and expand upon understanding of different experiences, to amplify voices that struggle to be heard. Brave spaces are not perfect, but they are an opportunity to engage in openness, to learning and building awareness around critical social justice issues. We can be true, we can be true about where we want to be and where we want to go. Beyond Brave Spaces means that we will take those truths together and visualize and conceive how we make meaningful advancements regarding equity, equality, diversity, inclusion, belonging, and interrupting systemic bias to move us forward with informed information to make to do action. Today, we will explore why racism is a public health crisis how healthcare inequities and COVID-19 provides a model for crosstalk between history, social inequality, and disease. In doing so, we will reframe health inequities as an ecological problem, and then focus on an unfortunate reality of how injustices can trigger a cascade of adverse health issues, including racial trauma. So with that in mind, get out your pens and your paper, listen up, and Jan, Dr. Carney, let's roll. You're up. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Heading Graham. I'm going to talk about racism as a public health crisis. Next slide. Racism is a public health issue, a public health crisis, and a public health emergency. The Pew Foundation, which is the graphic on the left, said being black is bad for your health and pervasive racism is the cause. We have more than three decades worth of public health research to substantiate uh, that statement. As an example, black women are up to four times more likely to die during their pregnancy and childbirth. Black men are more than twice as likely to be killed by police as white men and the average life expectancy of African Americans is four years lower than everyone else. So at this point, more than 20 cities and counties in at least three states, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin, have all declared racism as a public health crisis. Burlington, Vermont, has recently joined them. And the goal of all this is to shrink those health and 
years of, of healthy life gaps between African Americans and white Americans. Next slide, please. I want to talk about the why. Why is racism a public health crisis? And in order to do that, I have to talk a little bit about all those factors that influence our health. So first, I wanted to show you this county health uh, mapping project from Robert Wood Johnson. It's a wonderful website. I include all of the references that I'm talking about at the end so you can see them for yourself. And every year since 2010, they've done county health rankings. They found that this year's report found that our gaps in life expectancy remain. Rural counties are particularly struggling right now. And that in, most generally, the past affects the present. The counties that are the least healthy are part of the Deep South. Appalachia and our tribal lands, areas that have long histories of racism and discrimination. Child poverty remains a huge barrier to the health of many children in our country, and there are racial inequities in children living in poverty. On the right side of this graphic are the factors that influence our health. So we generally think about health care, and that's a piece of it. But if you look at Things like our physical environment, the air and water quality, and housing, those are very important. Social and economic factors are absolutely fundamental. Those are called the social determinants of health. I'm going to talk more about them. Things include education and income and employment and community safety. Access to health care is essential. And preventing health behaviors such as tobacco use alcohol and drug use, and improving diet and physical activity are also important determinants. All these determine our length and quality of life. Next, next slide, please. This is a figure from the Kaiser Family Foundation. She talks about the social and economic factors, the social determinants of health that really drive our health outcomes. And those health outcomes are not only our length of life, but also our how much or how many health care resources we require, whether we're health and have functional limitations. And all of these I really like because they're actionable. The economic stability, our neighborhood and physical environment, quality of housing, whether we have transportation, zip code and geography, I'm going to mention that a little bit more, access to high-quality education, food, Food security, having enough and high quality food, community and social context, and health care system components such as not only having health insurance, but having someone to see that who is culturally competent and that the health care quality is high enough. Overlying all these factors are the negative of racism and discrimination that can further negatively impact our health. Next slide, please. This is from the National Geographic, April 2018, called The Race Issue. It is a fabulous article with graphics that show us the impact over a lifetime of not enough finances, education, and health care disparities. Next slide, please. As an example, this is a very busy slide, but if you just look at the right part, if you are black, you have a higher risk of infant death, which is death in the first year of life, than if you're Asian, white, or Hispanic. This carries all the way through life to having a lower life expectancy uh, at, the, at the end of life. And factors such as challenging childhoods, graduation gaps, income gaps and employment gaps, living without health care insurance, and re help with retirement, all of these contribute along a lifetime of inequality. Next slide, please. I want to talk about a few specific examples. In addition to COVID-19, where we can see these uh, inequalities, this shows you, and this is from the CDC, the heart disease death rates, and it's for black individuals aged 35 and over by county. And the, the darker red are the highest death rates from heart disease. Now, if we were to show a map of everyone, you would see a similar pattern. With the highest rates over on the west and in, in the south, but what you will see in this is if you are black, 
you have higher death rates at every different category than other people. And these are, um, these go up quite substantially among those categories. And you can see the parts of the country where this is particularly a bad problem. If also you over were to overlay maps of the percent of people living in poverty, percent of unemployment, the percent of people lacking health insurance, the percent of people without a high school diploma, they all follow the same distribution. Many southern states have not expanded Medicaid, which is access to, to health insurance for people with limited incomes, although Louisiana and Arkansas have done this. Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, and Florida have not. And these are examples of foundational barriers to health care. Next slide, please. Some additional factors related to this, and this is again from the CDC, and this is a National Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System Survey. It shows that all the death rates from heart disease for black and African American individuals has dropped by 25% in the last 20 years, they're still twice as likely to die younger, prematurely, younger than age 50, than in people who are white. In addition, black and African American individuals are more likely to have high blood pressure. And if you look at things like access to health care, risk factors such as obesity and smoking, and especially those social determinants of health, as you can see on the charts, unemployment, living in poverty, could not see a physician because of costs, and on and on. These are far worse in black and African American people than in, in whites. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about the idea of zip code is a better predictor of health than the genetic code. This is something in recent years there's been a ton of research on. As an example, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has published quite a bit on this. This is from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and this shows the Del Mar Divide in St. Louis, Missouri, where if you look at Del Mar Boulevard that runs across the middle, in the neighborhoods north, the home values are lower, 5% have a college degree, and 99% are African American. Whereas south of Del Mar Boulevard, incomes and home values are higher, two-thirds have a bachelor's degree, and 70% are white. One of the things that, if you look at, at the people north of the Del, Del Mar Boulevard, they're much more likely to have heart disease or cancer. Next slide, please. This is from Time Magazine. And another example of some studies that show how your zip code might determine how long you live. And that difference could be decades. And th these authors, and in this study, they worked with the New York University to look at 56 of our, our 500 largest cities in the United States and found that even living a few blocks away, they're different, they're very close. You can have a shorter life expectancy that was 20 years or more. And so as an example, the top of the list, if you look at Chicago, and the maps are a little hard to see, but you can see that the life expectancy, which the darker colors are the lower life expectancy, in the parts of Chicago are the same as the areas that have the lowest employment rates or the highest unemployment rates. And the more food deserts or areas where there's not access to enough or healthy foods. Next slide, please. This was an article published in April in the New Yorker called The Black Plague. And it was a very, very powerful article and talks about the differences related to COVID-19. As an example, just a few statistics from this, but I really, I really recommend if you have time taking a look at it because it was really a thoughtful and extensive study of the huge inequities that are happening related to COVID. African Americans are about a third of Louisiana's population for more than 70% of the people who died from COVID-19. In Michigan, African Americans were 14% of the state's population, but accounted for 40% of all the people who died. In some cities like Detroit, it was far worse. You know, why is this? African Americans are more likely to have medical conditions, heart disease, asthma, diabetes, 
can increase the risk of dying if they do catch the disease. Racial discrimination remains rampant. Black people are more likely to be poor, unemployed, live in worse housing, and have poor quality of health and or no health care whatsoever. The other thing in terms of the recommendations that we made for COVID from social distancing and working remotely, only 20% of black workers can work from home. And in Louisiana, for, as an example, uh, and where the are some of the highest death rates from COVID-19, women earn only about 50 cents on the dollar earned by white men there. So huge economic differences as well. Next slide. I wanted to show you a few more examples. And at the end, I did put in the link to all these because we have some, some increasing number of very high quality data sources. Some are from academic collaborations that I mentioned, and some are from new, new sources such as the Washington Post and New York Times. This is one that's called the COVID Racial Data Tracker. And, and it says it's affecting black, indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color the most. And this was a collaboration between this tracking project and the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. You can see that nationwide, black people are dying at 2.5 times the rate of white people. And on this, you can go in and see in different areas what some of the data shows. Next, please. This is another one. And this is a the particularly good one from Emory University. And this just shows how the COVID-19 is impacting different communities. Again, this relates very closely to those social health determinants that I've been mentioning. This is an example. If you look at Georgia, counties with higher proportions of African American African American residents tend to have higher death rates of death from COVID-19. And you can see that in the chart on the right, how the trend line goes up. There's counties in Georgia that the trend um, is much higher death rates on the right. You can see the percent of African Americans on the on the lower axis and the death rates are going up um, on, on the uh, other, on the vertical axis. Next slide, please. This shows data from Vermont Department of Health who started to publish our COVID data and look at it from all demographics. The Vermonters represented the ma majority of COVID-19 cases, but African-American Vermonters had the highest rate for 10,000. Likewise, Hispanic Vermonters have higher rates than non-Hispanic Vermonters. Next slide. Death rates fortunately remain small in Vermont, and the people who are older tend to have the higher death rates than those with chronic conditions. And we're not seeing those same differences with race and ethnicity here in Vermont. Next slide. I wanted to take a moment to also mention environmental racism. And this was the Philadelphia Energy Solutions Re Refining Company that caught fire in June of, of 2019. And this, it, this, this facility, which was in South Philadelphia, where 60% of the residents were black, had a long history of environmental pollution. Most of the children grew up there with asthma. Uh, the asthma hospitalization rates were higher than any other area of Philadelphia and also higher than many cities in the United States. One of the city reports found that more than half of the city's cancer-causing air toxics were related to this particular plant. And then other organizations attributed at least 125 premature deaths each year from air pollution to this factory. This was just one example. There are other examples from lead poisoning and water quality in Flint, Michigan, also in poor uh, housing quality. Cancer Alley is an 85-mile-long stretch of the Mississippi River. It extends between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and that's lined with oil refineries and other plants. And people living in this area are more than 50 times as likely to get cancer than average than everyone else in the United States. Next slide, please. This is from the American Public Health Association. And this shows, again, climate change, health equity, are linked to vulnerable populations, as we've been talking about. There was a landmark 1987 report from the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice called Toxic Waste and Race. 
And that report is still very compelling. And after they published the fault more than 25 years later, there were still uh, inequities related to this. And, and people are more likely, vulnerable populations are more likely to be living next to these areas that are have contaminants that can adversely impact their health. Next slide, please. All of the previous slides I wanted to show you were just many of the reasons, all of these factors that contribute to health, the social factors, those health behaviors, access to health care, environmental factors, all of these are reasons why racism is a public health crisis. One of my colleagues that I work with from the Association of American Medical Colleges, Dr. Malika Fair, and we work on improving public health across the board in medical education. She talks about racism as the disease and health disparities as the symptoms. I've shown you a lot of data around the symptoms, but it's far more challenging to prevent the disease itself. So how do we think about that? And this was a slide that was from the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice called Paving the Road to Health Equity. You think about health equity and when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible, we have to measure how we're doing. I talked about the data. This doesn't have to be complicated data systems. It can be simple ways. It can be talking to community leaders, ways that we can over time know what the problems are and if we're making them any better. We need to have programs that actually work, that we have some evidence that they're helping, and policies, laws, and regulations to prevent those disparities and enable things like health insurance with only high-income country in the world that doesn't insure all of our citizens, as an example. So next slide. This is, from the this is from our own Department of Health, just a simple graphic to show that health equity exists when all people have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. And if you look at the figure on the left, not everybody can reach the apple on the tree. If you look at the one in the middle, we've started to take care of some of those symptoms to address some of the health disparities. But the one on the right really relies on policies to ensure that everyone truly has that equal opportunity. Next slide. This is back to the county health rankings and roadmaps. One of the things that they do is they compile the evidence of what worked. Everything I've shown you is, is pretty discouraging. It has deep roots and long history. And what I find more encouraging is that we're finding a few examples in some communities of things that actually help. As an example, Community health workers, lay health workers, can help people access and have access to health care. Faith community nursing, putting health care workers in certain faith communities to improve access to health care, health literacy, education for people. In the education arena, those social factors that are so important, alternative high schools for at-risk students, parent-child centers, in Chicago, these have been found to be extremely helpful. We have parent child centers here in Vermont. Air and water quality, something I didn't know about before I, I read through some of these examples, where there's something called a permeable pavement project. It, depending how you use the, the pavement itself and what materials you use, you can reduce runoff, water pollution, and the heat in urban areas that can adversely impact people's health. Next slide. The final slide I wanted to show you was an example of, called the Camden Coalition. And I grew up four miles from Camden in Camden, New Jersey. And this was an area when I was growing up extremely poor and had high rates of crime. A doctor there, and it was written about in, in a, an article in the New Yorker called The Hot Spotters. His name was Dr. Jeffrey Brennan. He wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but he became a family physician after he volunteered at a free clinic. And he was looking at all of, started to look at the data of crime, the police data, and the healthcare data, and found that one patient had 324 hospital admissions in five years, and that 1% of people accounted for 30%, almost a third of the healthcare costs in the city. 
So we started to work with nurses and social workers and try and create a system in which they connected people to the healthcare system and help cut right through some of the social factors that were making their health so, so poor. He really worked hard at this and got some Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funding and finally created the Camden Coalition, which I show you here. And they try to improve the well-being of individuals with complex needs. They have looked at the people who require all kinds of emergency department visits and hospitalizations, and through connecting them with health and social supports, reduce them. Their results have been absolutely phenomenal, both in terms of improving people's health and reducing health care costs. I'm going to stop there. And here's some resources for you. Thank you very much. Brandon, can you hear me? You are up next. Great. Well, thank you to everyone. Um, my name is Brandon Obunu. As you heard, I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. Um, what a tremendous uh, talk uh, by Dr. Carney there. In many ways, the smartest and nicest thing I can do is sprinkle in a few points um, and then get to the other speakers and questions because it's difficult to kind of follow such a kind of a, a, a thorough uh, survey of the problem, which is what Dr. Carney provided like only Dr. Carney can. Um, I'm a bit of a provocateur, and so in a panel called Not Just COVID, I'm actually going to talk about COVID, of course. Um, however, I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic from a little bit of a different perspective. I'm going to frame it in a manner that uh, makes us think about the situation as an example of how we continuously botch the interaction between race and disease, right? Because I think, I think, and it's still going on, obviously, but I think it provides like this really, really important set of lessons. Uh, now, by trade, I'm a computational biologist which is pretty boring and nerdy, but my career is defined by an increasing effort to understand, engage, and implement what we know about society into the work. And I think in my kind of wannabe social scientist self, I'm going to kind of give a talk similar to how you do in the social sciences, not you know, bereft of figures and graphs, which we could obviously do, but I kind of want to give you an arc of an argument. My interest in this topic kind of became, is, is animated uh, first when I was thinking about teaching a course, which I am in the fall, on the ecology of the great pandemics. Um, and the way I'm thinking about what those pandemics are, I'm, it's going to be Spanish flu, 1918, uh, HIV AIDS, and COVID-19. And that course is going to be very, very focused uh, on kind of, you know, obviously a bit about the biology and the disease emergence process and some molecular details, et cetera. But it's also going to be very firmly about the way the interaction between science and society influenced uh, the disease in these really important ways. Um, and I think they revealed all very, very essential characteristics, uh, limitations, blind spots to the way society was functioning at the time. Now, when you think about COVID-19, there's been a lot of comparisons, right, to those of us who are old enough to remember HIV AIDS. I mean, it's it's very interesting. I think I teach this stuff now, and college students, they treat HIV AIDS pandemic like it's the Spanish flu. It's like they think like it's something so distant in the past, and it's, it's, you know, it ages me in some sense, but it kind of reveals how quick we can forget a lot of the messages. And I think uh, that's kind of been, uh, that's been front and center in kind of the way we've botched a lot of the COVID-19 response. Um, there are similarities and differences, right? Obviously, I think some of them are about the natural history of disease of COVID-19 relative to HIV AIDS. There are much, much different viruses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think the, in, in the issues themselves are much, much different. Of course, HIV AIDS was uh, summarized, was kind of typified by a bunch of different kind of social justice issues, certainly in the United States, the LGBTQIA community, 
um, it was it was a chance for them, and I think it was a, we we had to learn a lot about that community in general, and I think because they were so disproportionately affected, particularly early on. I think later on the HIV/AIDS pandemic, of course, and and it really in, in the United States, all race was also very central as well. But it came an issue about global health and kind of global health equity and kind of health and human rights. And I think kind of there was a generation of scholars and practitioners that were raised in that era. Um, COVID-19 is different. I think why HIV, well, HIV AIDS kind of had these phases, if you will, starting from the early 80s, really until today, depending on how you think about it, um, in terms of the conversations. COVID-19's conversations have changed dramatically over the course of months. And I think we've been able to see that play out uh, in real time, right? Um, I mean, really, I mean, I could, I could conceivably just ask everyone who's listening now, including the panelists, to just close their eyes. And you don't have to actually close your eyes, but I mean, you know, close your eyes in a, you know, in a, in a sense. And just think back to March of 2020. You know, I, I, really, just think back, that's less than six months ago. And I, you know, and I do this just to kind of make sure I'm not crazy about what the dialogue was and what the conversation was and how we were thinking about things. I mean, you think about February and March of 2020, the narrative of the disease was completely different then than it is now. And it really has changed dramatically from month to month. I mean, just think for a second. There was a time when the epicenter of this pandemic was unquestionably in Italy and Spain. That, that, those were the places where the center of the pandemic lived. And I think all of the speculation, even the conspiracy theories, kind of related to why it was hitting those two places. I remember being in an African-American barbershop at that time where the conversation was, we're going to be all right because clearly this virus does not affect black people. I remember that debate. All right, I'm playing out, and you know the eye rolls, and of course, you know, and, and you know, and you think about the face of the disease now, and the face of what happened, really, really a month later, I mean, in April, um, is when that disease really, that 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 narrative really exploded, um, in, in the scientific and press and what have you, and you think about how rapidly that's happened. Um, so what happened? Like, what is it then that kind of changed over the course of several months? Why has it changed, and what are the things that we can learn about the way that narrative has changed and will continue to change, okay? How did that happen? By all molecular estimations, which is kind of one of my areas of expertise, this is the exact same virus that, right, was infecting eff effectively, you know, I mean, not, not literally, but effectively, it was the exact same virus that caused the same problems in Italy and Spain, okay? So in terms of, right, as far as we know, and there's been molecular changes, but w as far as we know, we are not confident that the differences in the disease uh, spread have anything to do with an organic change in the virus itself. Um, how then did this land the United States and have this dramatic, pretty immediately dramatic, uh, different impact on communities of color? What is the texture of that difference? And how does this example re uh, reveal precisely the perils of racial reasoning when it comes to the ecology disease and health inequities, and frankly, you could even kind of impose this on things like the achievement gap writ large. I think it's a, it's a perfectly good and interesting uh, framework to think about a lot of differences. And the way I think about um, this, I structure this into a, this like stages, if you will, when, we, when, we, when we're trying to understand a racial difference in the United States. There's like stages, if you will, kind of like there's stages of grieving, and sometimes these things are a little bit out of order, but I think we can discretize the conversations into kind of these three different categories. The first thing we do, right, um, is we biologize it. Okay. Um, we biologize it. Now, in the case of COVID-19, uh, there, there, I think there's, there's some, it, it's interesting because you can biologize it in two dimensions. There's been a lot of conversation about the difference if, of, uh, in, in kind of the R not the, the, the rate at which this thing spreads in various settings. Uh, that might be related to kind of fundamental differences in the molecular, you know, composition of the virus itself. That Italy has a fundamental different virus than Denmark does. It has a fundamentally different virus than New York does. And that the one infecting the African-American community in Milwaukee might be different than the one affecting, 
in, in, in South Florida or whatever. That's kind of once, and that one kind of emerged right away. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking the question, because as someone who studies the molecular evolution of viruses, they evolve quickly. I think that's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Um, but I think the data, right, until this day, there's, you know, there's some little bit of evidence that there's, there, there might be some different strains in certain settings, but I think there's nothing, there's no kind of smoking gun for explanation for why you have the differences in particular within communities of color in the United States. But I think looking towards the virus is one way we can biologize it. We can say, oh, we have a difference. Well, pretty clearly, it's because of the differences in this virus. The more pernicious one, however, and the one that kind of manifests in a lot of kind of in inequality conversations, um, is differences in the host, in the person being affected. Okay, um, we see this one manifesting. This is kind of the one that's at the root of scientific racism, for example, right? And um, that, that in conversations, in racist conversations about kind of the achievement gap, right? That people you can explain differences in how people are doing in school, you can as groups, or you can explain even like the historical trajectory of groups, right? By fundamental differences, we are fundamentally different, you know, subspecies of individuals. Of course, that's all nonsense. Um, but I think that manifested in COVID-19 as well. And again, there's nothing kind of essentially wrong with asking the question, but I think we should be, curi we should, we should be mindful of when those questions start to emerge, cross-examine them, um, and consider right, w why we're we asking that question and not others. So what's ironic and interesting about the COVID-19 phenomenon is early on there were speculations that, oh, well, African-American community has such an undue burden because there's some kind of West African, you know, signature uh, or immun immunological signature that could conceivably right, make them kind of more susceptible to infection. Um, and of course, what ended up happening is, if anything, the opposite. There are genetic signatures that we think are associated with susceptibility to COVID-19, and those exist, uh, it's a stretch of chromosome 2, I believe, which is associated with Neanderthal ancestry, which Af people of S. African descent have actually a paucity of. So if anything, right, I think it is individuals of European descent, and not all of them, but I think there's, a, there's, there's, there's some kind of precursors that we think might be associated with susceptibility to disease. They, we found a, a, no signature at all associated kind of with West African ancestry or uh, Latinx history or indigenous ancestry as far as we know. And these studies continue, and people are going to pour tens of millions of dollars into it, right? Um, and we're probably going to arrive at the same place that we were in Dr. Carney's conversation, right, which is it doesn't explain everything, right, I, I, I can almost, I'd bet a finger on it, right. Now, the last thing, I think once you've kind of gone through, right, the biologization of things, um, you move to something else, right, I think you can't kind of explain the difference in terms of biology, you explain it with behavior and culture. Right, and those are the two things, behavior and culture. Okay, well, if we can't come up with an organic reason why this is, and that goes for the achievement gap as well. There are people who do not think that you can explain achievement gap issues, be they in academia or otherwise, or socioeconomic or otherwise, um, with biological explanations, but it is the culture of group X that explains why they're having a hard time, right? right? And this one is just, of course, as problematic as racist as the other explanations. And, um, and this one, of course, manifested most flagrantly from Surgeon General Jerome Adams, right, a black man um, who in April right, made the comments that are, frankly, the most imp embarrassing public comments I've ever heard from a black man, frankly, and I'm like a fan of hip hop, okay, so, right, um, but they also double as the most inaccurate medical or scientific comments I've ever heard from a professional in a public setting, ever, okay. And he quoted, of course, speaking of kind of protecting yourself against the virus and personal protective equipment and lifestyle choices. I mean, we, I don't even know what he was talking about. He said, and speaking of mothers, we need you to do this. If not for yourself, then for your umbrella. Do it for your granddaddy. Do it for your big mama. Do it for your pop pop. This is a racist comment. It makes assumptions about kind of the relationship between ethnic groups and their kind of allegiance to personal protective behavior as if community colors are the ones who are anti-personal protective equipment and as we've seen the exact opposite is true in the United States. Okay, so it was kind of a presumptuous comment, it was an unscientific comment, and it was an attempt to shift the blame for the disproportionate right, infection rates to these behaviors and making a behavioral claim, which is just Frankly, I mean, I don't, I don't know what just north of criminal is, but it should be that. You cannot, because that is a dangerous thing to tell people in that context. The truth is that COVID-19 is born from an interaction between humans, agents, disease, and environment. 
right? And this is the lesson that we learn from the science of ecology. History and structural violence and discrimination and only, uh, are, for, are currently really mostly firmly discussed. I think medicine has picked up the mantle in the last 10 to 15 years, but it has historically been the domain of the social sciences and the humanities. They're not ne taken nearly as seriously as actors in the mechanistic experience of disease as they should be. And most charitably, this is because the current manifestations of race and racism aren't easy to understand. It's hard to kind of detect, like, generations of, um, you know, structural violence. But as Dr. Carney outlined, it's not that hard. We have a lot of data now to back this up. Um, you know, I think what I would argue and the way I'll close is that um, I implore my scientist colleagues, and in particular my quantitative colleagues, to continue to pursue manifestations of structural violence as a scientific frontier of modern medicine and molecular science. You can see the signatures of this in government, in policing and housing, and you see it in disease, and I'd suggest that this is the single most important scientific question of our time, and it should be given the place in society, like the race to kind of understand the structure of DNA, or the race to understand the kind of, uh, to map the genome. I think mapping the relationship between structural violence and disease is the question for the next century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon, Dr. Abuno. Um, I will take a moment to just kind of give a little shout out to you because um, Brandon is a former um, UVM um, George Washington Henderson fellow. And so he's at Yale now. So I'm so glad to um, see you back visiting with us. So thank you so much. Dr. Coleman, um, thank you. Thank you for your patience and being here. Um, and um, take us on to the next. Um, focus that we will um, have some time to have some questions around. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to sp share this space with all of you and with Dr. Carney and Dr. Obuno. So as this slide um, demonstrates, I'm going to be talking about racialized trauma and healing soul wounds. Now this could be an entire course and a multi-day seminar. So I'm going to give a brief overview and hope that it sparks Something resonates and sparks further curiosity for further exploration. I start with, again, acknowledging the sacred space that we are all on and that we are um, um, meeting with today. And this beautiful soul is Rosalie Fish. She is a member of the Cowlitz tribe in Washington state. And the red hand over her mouth is in recognition and in honor of the many, many murdered and missing Native American women and girls. Uh, she runs her track meets in high school. Every track meet, she has that symbol. I want to just acknowledge and uh, share that according to statistics from the Department of Justice, uh, on some Native American reservations, women are 10 times more likely to be murdered than the national average. Notably, there have been 5,712 reported cases of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls since 2016, yet only 116 were logged in the Department of Justice database. More than four in five uh, Native American women have experienced violence, and more than one in two have experienced sexual violence, according to the Indian Law Resource Center. Fortunately, these numbers only represent a fraction of the actual data, as lack of diligent and adequate federal response contributes to limited available statistics. This is a diagram that um, social, licensed social worker Resma Menakim, he is the author of My Grandmother's Hands. If you have not read the book or heard of it, I highly endorse it. Um, but he has created this wonderful diagram. And it's really a, a visual. I won't spend a lot of time going through it. But it, it is another visual that offers what um, Dr. Obunu and Dr. Carney have already discussed, the impact of intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, on um, health risk behaviors, early death, disease, disability, and social problems. As you will see here on the side, one thing that he um, discusses is black body taxation and white body supremacy. Again, these are concepts that cannot be left out of the conversation when looking at health disparities within BIPOC communities. We'll talk a bit more about that as we, as we move on. Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy. Um, this is her book, um, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. I'm going to spend some time focusing on this because it's an ex 
explanatory theory that looks at multi-generational trauma for uh, black Americans and Africans throughout the diaspora. Many of us were kidnapped, shipped, murdered, raped, sold, tortured, our ancestors were. And so 300 plus years of trauma, no help. Did the trauma continue? Absolutely. And there was consistently not help. So the impact of the sustained the impact of the sustained trauma is also sustained, meaning the trauma has continued as well as the impact. Now, prior to even delving into what PTSS is, I want to offer uh, an opportunity to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder as defined by the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the fifth version, uh, because I believe it provides an important framework when understanding the um, impact of racial trauma and historical trauma on uh, black people. So many are familiar with the term PTSD. It was a term that was coined uh, essentially from um, vets from the Vietnam War. Um, it has expanded and now includes complex trauma as well. And so with PTSD, in order to qualify for that diagnosis, there needs to be an event in which your life or others, and this could be something witnessed, was threatened and as well, or was believed to be threatened. And then there are three components that are important, hypervigilance, avoidance, and re-experiencing. So when we think about this, even in light of George Floyd's murder and the trauma that black people have experienced from that one isolated murder, not counting the countless others that have come before and since, um, it was traumatic and continues to be. Now when we think about um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, as it states here on the slide, it's a theory that explains the etiology of many of the adaptive survival behaviors in African American communities throughout the United States and the diaspora. It is a condition that exists as a consequence of multi-generational oppression of Africans and their descendants resulting from centuries of chattel slavery, a form of slavery which was predicated on the belief that African Americans were inherently genetically inferior to whites. This was then followed by institutionalized racism, which continues to perpetuate injury and continues to this day. And this results in what Dr. Um, DeGroote discusses as MAP. So multi-generational trauma together with continued oppression, the absence of opportunity to heal or access the benefits available in the society, thus leading to post-traumatic slave syndrome. It's important. There, there you know, the book is an example, and there are many wonderful videos of her seminars discussing this. If this is of interest to learn more, I really recommend that you look into it, because from this as a foundational understanding, if healthcare and healthcare providers understood this syndrome and this theory, how would that then impact how we interact with black people that come into the hospital? come into our clinics, how would that impact the intake assessments, the diagnoses that are handed out, as well as the treatment modalities. It would have an immense impact. And so not to belabor the, the point, I think there have been wonderful examples from uh, my fellow panelists on mental health impacts of structural oppression and historical um, oppression. There are two things that I do want to just highlight that I think are important and related to black mental health. Um, as it's stated here, allostatic load, it's a technical term for the physiological consequence of chronic exposure to stress. It is at the heart of a number of adverse health effects that disproportionately impact black people, this specifically focusing on black women especially, including increased cortisol levels. It's our stress hormone released in our body, higher rates of obesity, and higher rates of low birth weight babies. The stress essentially weathers and ages the body and can lead to premature mortality, as we've discussed previously. There have been many studies examining trauma exposure among community samples of black males, and that has shown that approximately 62% have directly experienced a traumatic event in their lifetime, 72 have witnessed a traumatic event, and 59 have learned of a traumatic event involving a friend or family member. So the idea that um, a uh, black person coming into the clinic or where I am at the hospital without having experienced or heard about or witnessed trauma is so low. The chances of that are so low. So if, as providers, if we are able to serve our communities, especially BIPOC communities, through a trauma-focused lens, 
the impact that that would have on health outcomes, I believe, is great. We spent some time talking about the vagus nerve as um, Reismomenicki re-termed the soul nerve, which I love, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But this is a diagram that just shows that the vagus nerve or the wandering nerve is the unifying organ of the entire nervous system. If you'd like to learn more about the research that's been done on the vagus nerve, um, psychiatrist Stephen Porges um, does a lot of work on that as well. Uh, but as you can see, the vagus nerve and the, the soul nerve, it controls the major, you know, our major bodily functions. It controls our ability to fight or flee, how we respond to stress. It also controls our ability to eat and rest. I'll spend a little bit more time describing that. Let me move this slide. So as I mentioned, um, Resma Menachem terms the vagus nerve as the soul nerve. And in order to fully embody the racialized trauma that BIPOC individuals carry in our bodies. And I think that that's just a brilliant renaming of this because the soul nerve is a highly complex organ that communicates through vibes and sensations. It also impacts how we relate and are in relationship and being with other people. So when we think about the impact of historical trauma and the impact that that has on our mental health, particularly for communities of color, and how they may interact with white communities. It cannot be ignored that the soul nerve is at play. Um, this also explains why many of us may sense things in our belly or our gut. You know, as the, I'll, I'll flip back for a moment, as this diagram shows, it controls the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Our heart rate, even stimulating saliva, um, how uh, we are able to even, um, you know, feel things in our body, digest foods, um, take in nutrients, all of these things are impacted by the soul nerve. Notably, the soul nerve does not connect to our thinking brain, the prefrontal cortex. And I want to pause for a moment on this because the, uh, when there is a trauma response or even perceived danger within our environment, our reptile brain, the amygdala, kind of in the back hind part of our brain is activated. That's where the fight, flight, or freeze, and surrender responses are housed. Now, in order to deactivate that, um, our prefrontal cortex needs to get back into control, and then our rational thinking brain can kind of take over. Now, when the internal alarm system, like the amygdala, is triggered, it doesn't just go off when the threat is no longer in your face. Uh, your body and your mind no longer trust that your environment is safe, that um, people that may remind you of your uh, oppressor and or aggressor are, you know, are safe. And so in order to kind of reactivate that and reestablish a sense of security and safety, there are some things that can be done and that we'll talk about. So the soul, as it says here, the soul nerve, like our lizard brain, has zero capacity to think and controls when our bodies constrict and relax. So, so that, is, that is an important aspect that um, as we think about our health and our well-being and our ability to move through spaces without um, the chronic stress, the impact of the chronic stress, and also being triggered, um, there's, it's difficult. And, you know, in order to, you know, it can help reduce pain, improve mood, and help manage fear. Um, so one of the things that the soul nerve does regulate is the breathing, the heart rate, and our blood pressure. All of the things that have been discussed previously as impacting um, health outcomes. Okay, so we're aware that there's a soul nerve. We're aware of the impact of racial trauma and historical oppression. What do we do about it? Um, these are some suggestions. Again, um, it is uh, just a brief overview. I think that there are longer conversations that need to be had in terms of fully um, bridging the gap between Western idioms of distress and wellness as to even non-Western populations. So cell nerve training um, involves somatic reprocessing and engaging our minds, bodies, and spirits. You can learn to activate and regulate your body on demand with practice. Some of those things can be reconnecting with indigenous modes of healing, such as humming, drumming, breathing, rest, um, even tapping and doing it um, bilaterally um, can be really helpful. Um, there are some really wonderful um, suggestions and exercises that are housed within the book, My Grandmother's Hands. Um, 
one thing that I am really passionate about, and uh, my background in psychology is in um, liberation psychology, is the idea of uh, decolonizing our healthcare systems and how vital that is. Um, liberation psychology offers a framework and uh, a map on how to do that. Um, liberation psychology was coined by um, Salvadorian um, um, social justice activist uh, Martin Barro. Um, he was assassinated in the 80s during the Salvadorian Civil War that was funded by the United States. And so with liberation psychology, again, um, offers a blueprint that's supposed to be for liberatory medicine, although maybe that's a um, Freudian slip <laughs> and can be applied for laboratory as well. Um, psychological problems as primarily individual obscures the relationship between personal estrangement and social oppression. So these are some things that liberation psychology challenges in terms of the um, best practice, evidence-based way that we understand um, health and well-being and illness and disease. So this idea that um, psychological problems are just individual, again, completely erases the impact of historical oppression. Um, De-ideologizing everyday experience, so this, this cultural stranglehold on what realities are studied and understood by social scientists. So when I read an article, the first thing that I look for is um, the authors. Who's asking the questions? Who's been left out of um, you know, deciding which questions should be asked? Um, I think that this is something that within the social sciences and medicine uh, we can do much better at, about really questioning what is the reality that um, we are holding as normal and um, which other realities are being erased and or ignored and minimized and truthfully stigmatized in many ways. The idea of virtues of the people, it's a strength-based approach that uses the resiliencies of the oppressed as their tools for liberation, meaning it comes from within. That in true liberatory medicine and practice, um, the provider understands that the answers lie within the community that they are attempting to serve and the individuals that they are attempting to help facilitate healing. That it is not a come in and I'm going to save this group of people or this person, but instead bearing witness and creating a safe, non-judgmental um, non space for the inherent resiliencies and strengths to emerge um, for folks to be able to walk through healing um, themselves. These are some references that um, were utilized in the presentation, and I will pause here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. I really appreciate that, Dr. Coleman. Um, may I follow up with some questions as uh, we are having questions come in um, into the chat, um, but I want to kick us off a little bit, um, and I really like to stay a little bit where you're at, uh, Marissa, which is to ask you, I remember the sort of emotional injury I was feeling as a uh, woman, black woman, African-American woman, um, when injuries were occurring and death, deaths and murders were happening uh, around people who, two people who look like me. And, um, and I was talking with particularly and especially African American and black women and uh, who were just tired of being tired. And it doesn't mean that men weren't either, but I just happened to be speaking with this group. And uh, we started talking about can we just have a day off? Um, you know, the concept in some institutions that are practicing um, having a day off, um, sort of um, being black, um, being off while black. Can you say a little bit more around um, the experiences or your belief that um, taking a pause from the day-to-day from the -day because there's so much um, emotional injury around who we are that we may need that mental and physical rest. Is that something that's viable? Have you heard of that before? What do you think of that or think about it? Yeah, yeah I was actually just talking about that multiple times this week um, with um, people in my own personal life as well as patients that I've met with. You know, the idea of being a um, BIPOC person and resting is revolutionary. And that is a way to in fact, regain some control and to decolonize our own ways of understanding rest and work. 
And so when I think about it from the historical context of um, that rest was not afforded to our ancestors, and that this idea that we had to work ourselves literally to the bone and to death for a white person, or in that case, the slave master's benefit financially and many other ways, um, is oppressive. And so many of us have internalized that, that we have to work overtime in order to get where we need to go. And yes, many, much of that is um, a symptom of oppressive systems that we have to interact with every day. But I encourage people to rest, particularly um, during this time. It's like being inundated with images, with videos, with um, articles in the news and the media. It is traumatizing, re-traumatizing, and also um, can have negative impacts on our health. Thank you. I, I'm watching um, um, Brandon shake his head, not his, not his head right now, and um, I want to hear from him on this thought, um, particularly because I wanted to follow up. I, too, was one of those people who was sitting in front of the television when the Surgeon General spoke, and um, really um, used, you know, uh, Big Mama and Pop Pop and also made references to some of the ills in society like alcohol, um, uh, if you think that alcohol is an ill in society, but in terms of referencing it and smoking to uh, reference my Pop folks. And um, I was somewhat insulted. Uh, maybe I was actually insulted. And so maybe if you could just follow up a little bit what Dr. Coleman spoke about in terms of the stress that this causes um, BIPOC folks, and um, and maybe just a little bit more, if you could say something a little bit more about the comments that were made and whether or not it led us to trust more or not trust as much as we should some of the healthcare professionals, because that didn't seem very thoughtful, at least in my eyes, but that's just a single story. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the interaction between the misinformation sphere and the medical and biomedical community is another whole conversation, and I think, uh, you know, I think that's, that's been a, a kind of a, a, a big issue here. And I think, frankly, I mean, I, I don't know how else to say this, I don't think uh, Surgeon General Allen, I, I think his, his affiliation with the White House kind of compromises his, his kind of uh, integrity immediately. So I don't think anyone was surprised in some ways, I think it was the nature of the comments that were, and, and I think, like I said, the, the reason why they were so deeply problematic is that they were a distraction, a very deep and dark and problematic distraction uh, when it came to getting people, people were losing lives. So it, it's one thing to do something like that in an ideological sense, right, to simply say, um, right, to, to blame culture on an, an achievement gap or to blame culture. We're talking about a live pandemic where people need to know the things they need to know in order to, right, to, to prevent the spread of disease. And there was no basis to make that comment in those communities. None. Right? I mean, and, and we're seeing now, right, because that, that, right, that, the community now, as we're seeing, when it comes to kind of personal protective equipment and it kind of, and, you know, be engaging in, in belief in science, I mean, that is not the community that has a problem believing in science. Right, and we were seeing that very centrally now. So, um, so I just felt, I, even, the emotions aside, I just felt like it was irresponsible from a public health and a, and a biomedical uh, perspective and, and dangerous for that reason. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I have a question um, that I'd like to ask, and then I'm going to really move into our audience. And this is um, for Dr. Carney Jan. Um, you know, when I saw the numbers, it was absolutely um, very daunting, the, the data that you had and so forth. Can you share any concrete um, thing that ordinary people can do to make a difference or have an impact on health disparities? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the things are we have to educate ourselves on what's going on in the communities around us. You know, it's very different, that whole the whole health by zip code that just a few miles away, people may have a very different living and health experience that you do. And what can you do? Lots. You can advocate for them. You can help change those policies that makes things things a lot better. So I would say that some of those those county health indicators you, it, were, were frankly shocking. Some of the differences that if you look in Baltimore, 
of one neighborhood versus another are just shocking. What can you do? You can acknowledge that these situations are horrible and that if people can't eat healthy, if, if there's not a grocery store there and advocate for a grocery store, or the kinds of, we're talking about COVID, the people who are more likely to get exposed to that are the ones who have to be working with the public every single day. And some of those are lower paying occupations. So I, I would say that you know the communities around you and where something is not right, somehow get involved. Find a way you can get involved, whether it's the governance or a community not-for-profit or volunteering and to make something better. Thank you. I appreciate the idea about, like, let's, let's really start saying something. Uh, respectfully, but let's say something. Let's do something. Let's step up. Let's be active um, participants in making things better. So um, I'm getting ready to um, provide to you a question from our um, viewers. Thank you so much, Wanda. And we do have questions, and, and we're looking for more questions from our viewers on YouTube. We've seen a lot of chat and a lot of back and forth. We really are thankful for the interaction that our viewers are having with each other as well. Um, so we do have a question, Wanda. I wanted to um, pose this question that Hans asked. Um, can one of our panelists describe the kind of research and statistics that unveil relationships between structural violence and disease. Thank you. Brandon, why don't you start with that? Uh, sure, uh, I'll start with that. Uh, number one, I think Dr. Carney's talk had a lot of that in it, and I, so I was, uh, hopefully Dr. Carney will follow up. Um, but I think, I think there's some really good examples. So there's some classic stuff. Um, there's the work of Nancy Krieger, who kind of has looked at kind of the interaction between microaggression and things like blood pressure and cancer. Right? There's, that that kind of goes back, so if you want to name that I think the, the relationship between kind of even things like microaggression on a daily level and kind of hypertension, um, right, that goes, that work goes back some time and is, is very quite, uh, I think some of the best data are probably the one about kind of um, ethnicity, uh, the, the one about kind of infomortality rate and low birth weight in particular in African American women, or that's, 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 the, that's some of the cleanest data we have. That's kind of controlling that's controlling for things like socioeconomic status even, so even kind of, you know, um, and behavior and controlling for behavior and, and, and in fact, right, there's some, th there's ways to control for genetics because immigrant black women don't have the same problem as African American women, all right, so th there's a lot of kind of interesting data about that. I think some of the most recent stuff that I'm excited about uh, is a colleague of mine named Sam Scarpino who's also a former UVM faculty member who recently published a kind of a paper about zip code and influenza risk and he basically talked about a lot of the influenza statistics in the, I think in the part of Texas where he was doing this study. They, they basically, it doesn't even, the, the influenza risk doesn't even cover kind of poor, poor zip codes, um, the, right, the, the surveillance. So basically, uh, poor, uh, poor communities are under surveilled. And I think a really recent kind of exciting and problematic one that I heard of, a, a, a friend of mine is a clinician, a colleague of mine is a, a physician who treated COVID during the kind of uh, big outbreak in New York City. And the data are now out here, but he said early on that it was a big controversy because they were noticing mortality rate differences at different hospitals within the same city. Right. Um, and of course, the different hospitals, right, different demographics, I mean, different socioeconomic statuses, et cetera. So there's a lot of kind of, uh, there's a lot of kind of good results, some of them going back many decades at this point, and some of them kind of more cutting edge in the locality differences and, and outcome differences um, uh, by, by zip code and, and ethnic uh, background, et cetera. Thank you. Jan, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that was a great answer, Brand. I think that was a perfect answer, Brandon. Wonderful. Thank you both. We have another question. We do. Thank you so much, Wanda. We have another question from Jean that says, what do you see as one of the most impactful things that UVM should work on this fall to help reduce the effects of racial trauma among BIPOC members of the university and or surrounding communities? Thank you. Dr. Coleman, do you think you could take that on? Um, I will certainly try. I um, am immersed in conversations um, very similar to that at the medical center. Um, you know, 
a couple of things that I think are really important to, to keep in mind is uh, the importance of recruitment and retention of BIPOC um, staff and faculty um, so that there are safe spaces um, for um, students and for employees to be able to continue to go. Um, I know, um, Dr. Hedden Grant, you do a lot of work in that regard in your department, um, and I'm thankful for that. Um, I also have noticed, even just within the hospital, the um, presence of um, employee resource groups is also um, something that is really helpful. Um, and that could even be in the student level as well. Um, and then um, continuing to offer forums like this, where there are um, listening tours, where there um, are open dialogue spaces for people to come together and to talk about their experiences, and spaces that privilege BIPOC voices. And most importantly, um, I think that there are many people within the UVM community that are sharing their experiences, are sharing recommendations, and so continuing to listen and recognizing, again, from if we think about it from like a liberatory standpoint, you know, the, what the community is asking for, like they, they are best um, able to assess and kind of know what their needs are. So really including people from all levels of the organization as you're planning and thinking about policies and strategies. Thank you. I, I just want to echo that I think it's very, very important to uh, for individuals uh, within the University of Vermont community and beyond um, to really listen and listen to BIPOC folks, um, to educate themselves. Don't just count on me and other folks who look like me in the community to educate you on everything. I was so excited and ecstatic for the support, and support um, that was outpouring after some of um, traumatic things that had occurred particularly around the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Teller and so forth. Um, and at the same time, in those same conversations, I was asked a lot about what could I do, you know, meaning what could they do and what should they do. And so just like anything else that you don't have a lot of information about, you go out and do your research. And so um, I asked for people as a person of color to do that work. And sitting here and being a part of this conversation with us is a beginning uh, um, part of doing that work. So I just do encourage the, that um, folks will listen um, and educate themselves. And that's a real big beginning. But there are lots of other things um, that folks can do. And we want to we want to keep exploring that here at the University of Vermont, um, as we've been saying, together. We're going to um, get another question here. You bet. Thank you, Dr. Hedding Grant. We do have another question Sherwood asks um, to our panelists. What explains the resistance in healthcare in addressing racism? Can you give an example of how a BIPOC patient could handle this? Dr. Carney, do you have a thought you might share with us? I think that. I think that when I listen to Dr. Abunu and talking about sort of some of the concept, concepts that are not necessarily how you're educated in the health professions, sometimes it takes an additional education to be able to, to, to kind of grasp those concepts, and both from history and community, from the past to the present, and how those are impacting people in the here and now. And I, I think that, you know, Dr. Henning Grant, sort of the health professionals listening and continuing to be open to education from a variety of sources, including the patients and, and the general public about sort of what are the biggest healthcare concerns that people have from their perspective and, and why is that? So I, I would say it's that ongoing communication that we're talking about. Thank you. Brandon, would you offer any additional thoughts? Um, I, I think, yeah, just to, you know, to echo that sentiment, I mean, I think, I think people are resistant to racism for two reasons, and they're related. Um, well, for one, they, like, it's the ignorance, like Dr. Carney talked about, just not knowing. Um, but it, it, it forces you to kind of think about your position in some uncomfortable ways. And I think people are always going to fight uh, their, you know, things that make them challenge their positionality. Um, so I think that's where the resistance comes from. To the question of what 
can patients do? I think that's a fascinating one. That's kind of like, okay, well, armed with this in this ecosystem that is kind of engineered in these ways to deliver you a substandard outcome, what does an individual, what can an individual do? Um, that's a, a, you know, tricky one. I, I, I think, um, I think being, you know, I think in the patient context, and Dr. Coleman can, you know, can comment here, I think in the patient context is kind of knowing your rights, knowing kind of the things that are afforded you and the rights that you're, the, the things that you, that you should be had, that you being an informed kind of a person in your interaction with a provider of any kind um, is, is, gonna, is one way that I found to be empowering in, in, the, in the life of myself, um, having had to navigate health problems with, you know, African American women in my family, for example. Thank you. I, li I saw Dr. Coleman lean in, so I know you have something you want to share. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, so I echo, you know, the, the comments that have already been raised. I, I think when we think about the resistance in healthcare to addressing racism, to me it, is, it boils down to privilege and power. And so when we think about other systems within our society where privilege and power um, are pervasive, right, um, where white supremacy is ingrained in how the systems were created, I don't believe that healthcare is exempt from that. Um, in terms of how could a BIPOC patient handle the system, my gut is, is okay, but the system needs to figure out and change how to best support the patient versus putting the onus on the patient. Yet and still, I agree that um, empowering um, those around us to know their rights. I see that a lot within um, working with um, um, patients where English is, the, um, is not their first language, right? To, to take some extra time and educate them about their rights to demand an interpreter. Um, that is a professional interpreter, not a friend, not a community member that's visiting in your room, but their own rights to get a medically, um, you know, a, a medical certified professional interpreter. Thank you. Dr. Coleman, I, I wanted to ask a, a question and um, as we start to sort of um, get down to the end, I wanted to go back to the uh, racialized trauma. Um, what would you say if, so, if I shared with someone that I was feeling or having racial trauma? Would you say that I was mentally ill? No, no. I, I, that wouldn't be something I would say to anybody, but um, certainly not um, regarding racialized trauma. I mean, a lot of my work is around supporting folks that are impacted and experiencing um, racialized trauma. You know, the first thing that I think of is to just validate and empathize and let them know that that is not something that is wrong with them, that it is a systemic um, problem that we are all interacting with and impacts us differently. And I would focus on a strengths-based approach to empower them to know that just as trauma can be passed down through generations, so does resilience. So let's uncover and tap into the innate resiliencies that um, all of us individuals carry with. Thank you for sharing that. I ask that question because, as I know, there's oftentimes those labels come with um, the discussion and conversation of talking about racialized trauma. The last question I'd like to ask, um, and whoever feels led to respond to this, um, it is really in regards to COVID-19 and the pandemic. I mean, it really has exposed, put on the front line, a lot of the inequities um, in terms of access, affordability, and treatment. When I think about all of the folks who may be on this, um, um, who are viewing us right now, um, those who have direct um, contact with patients, those who have family members, um, regular citizens who are, who are helping to support folks in the community, um, nurses, doctors, social workers, um, mothers, children, um, what can you say to them in terms of making sure that the, that those who are ill, who are vulnerable, who need support and help are getting the best thoughtful, fair care that there is um, in this pandemic and beyond. Um, how do we leave this talk, um, our time together, empowering people to do more, to be better at what they do and to understand what's going on? Um, maybe if we could have some final words from each of you, I would appreciate that on that topic. Dr. Carney, you mind starting? 
Sure. The, um, some of the things are ask people where they live. You know, people come to the, when they're ill, they come to the hospital, they come to the office. They're out of context. Ask about their neighborhood, their family, their occupation, their education, what their what they what their life is like. And the better you understand them, the more you can help them in all aspects of their health, not just the reason they're immediately in front of you for. Thank you. Dr. Coleman? Sure. Um, I One thing that comes to mind is recognizing that the patient is the expert of their own experience and to not collude with racial gaslighting and questioning the reality of individuals that um, may have different lived experiences than you. So really collaborating and being a partner in your care with the patients is crucial. Thank you very much. Dr. Obono? Uh, I'll scale my answer out, and it's not so much about the in individual patient, or it is about the individual patient, but I think being wary of the information that you're consuming, and I think being wary, 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 I think there's just, uh, the, I think that's key. When it comes to COVID-19, practically speaking, do not listen to the White House at this point. That, that, I think that it, it's just, it's, it's unsigned, that's not a political comment, that's a scientific comment. Uh, the information there is wrong, and it is harmful, and it is killing people. So um, I think certainly Dr. Fauci, Anthony Fauci's information is uh, much, much better. So I think consuming the right information I think is going to be key, and I think that will kind of trickle down to the patient level because you'll know kind of what to demand and what the latest science is saying. So I think leading with the science, kind of uh, ignoring kind of anti-science and manipulative uh, rhetoric I think is, uh, is going to be what's most important moving forward. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for all your honesty and your truth. I really have enjoyed our time together. I'm going to turn over back to Nicole. Thank you so much, Dr. Heading Grant, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Abunu, and um, Dr. Carney. What a fascinating, eye-opening, and hopefully inspiring conversation to think about how you can go beyond brave spaces. We also do want to share um, an opportunity to showcase what you have learned today. This is an opportunity for a digital badge, um, is learn and earn. Uh, it's a digital badge for participation of the information that you have learned today. A little bit of information on the screen there. We'll also put a link in the chat box um, where you can request the digital badge for participation as well. And it's something that you might want to put on your LinkedIn, your social media profiles to share that this information is important to you and your continued learning about systemic racism is important to you. So we hope that you do look for that opportunity. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. We've had so many wonderful comments um, and questions coming from our viewers on YouTube. Thank you very much for the team here at UVM and Wanda Heading Grant's team in the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion to help bring this information forward. And we're not done yet. Tomorrow afternoon, same time, 2 o'clock to 3.30, as well as our second session in connection with the College of Education and Social Services. We hope that you will join us tomorrow as we continue this conversation. And if you have not had a chance yet to take a look at the Amazing Grace videos and also the Finding Answers Together, the teach-ins, please do that because it's incredibly valuable information as we all try to learn more and try to overcome systemic racism. Thank you very much, everyone. We wish you well, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.